Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, as part of this amazing uh, conference. I hope you are enjoying. On a, on a Saturday morning, you probably notice it from the kids screaming in my background. Uh, so thank you so much again for, for joining us. And here uh, today, we are here today to talk about uh, uh, the role of contracts in essentially overcoming, you should see my, my slide, by the way, uh, the role of contracts in overcoming hierarchies uh, and uh, how we are, what we are, what are we seeing, uh, let's say, in, in this evolution of organizing uh, according to the experiences from, from pioneers such as higher. So, uh, and we all, of course, we will also share with you some more information around the EMCOS project that is a core part of this session. So, first of all, uh, let me just uh, give you some context. Uh, here is Simone from, from Boundaryless. Boundaryless is the partner with uh, HMI uh, to, uh, that runs the open source research, uh, Rendan Hay Research Center. And uh, what we do, essentially, we do uh, frameworks and services for large and small companies to adopt innovative business models and innovative organizational models for the 21st uh, uh, century. As part of this mission, we, we build these uh, frameworks in, in Credit Commons, uh, so uh, with open access that everybody can use, uh, we are famous, let's say, for the uh, platform design toolkit that is the uh, most used, uh, I would say, methodology, complete methodology for uh, the uh, evaluation and design of uh, platform-based uh, business model, marketplaces and, and things like that. But also in the last couple of years, we have been working with HMI and higher very intensively in developing what we call the TRIO or EEO toolkit, that is a, a, a framework that we have developed based on, uh, inspired by Rendan Hay. Essentially, you can see that as a as an open source version of Renda Hay uh, that we are developing to allow companies to engage with these possibilities and uh, uh, basically organizational developers, consultants, and everybody that wants to engage with this uh, to try it out and to um, do their own work and together with us. Uh, as part of our collaboration with Hire, we also develop the um, uh, master classes, and next one is coming up very soon in in October. So, uh, Emanuele, we share with you some links in the chat if you are interested to that. And we are building a community of practice uh, around this topic of uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem enabling organizations, uh, as we will see. Um, uh, then uh, we do research, of course, and uh, you can watch some of the videos that we have, prepared, we have made uh, on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you follow our blog, uh, you will also see that we are trying to integrate uh, entrepreneurial organizing with uh, uh, these new growth opportunities that we see, platform design and business model innovation. So lots of work going on in the background. And of course, as part of our work, and we'll talk about this much, much more later on, later on uh, we are trying to launch this uh, um, ecosystem around software. So we want to build software technologies that can empower this transformation, this transition towards these new ways of organizing. So first of all, before we move into the content, I want to introduce the uh, guests for today. Uh, I am going to moderate this panel, and with me we have uh, a few people. First of all, Emanuele Guinterelli, uh, uh, Boundless uh, Trio Market Enterprise Lead. Good morning, Emanuele. Good morning. Happy to be here. And you, have, you will be probably familiar with, with Emanuele. And uh, uh, then we have with us uh, Rob Solomon. Uh, good morning, Rob. Can you just say hello and say a couple of words about you? Yeah, hi everybody. Very uh, uh, good early morning at 4 a.m. here in New York City. Um, I am the head of finance at Consensus Mesh, which is a uh, blockchain uh, venture studio and portfolio management company. I'm also the founder of Cone.network, which is a software for 3EO style companies. Before that, I had worked in the holocratic context at uh, the downtown project in Zappos. Thank you, Rob, and thank you so much for uh, just joining us after just a very short uh, sleep after an international travel, uh, a national travel. So thank you so much. Uh, Sasha, good morning. Sasha Kellert from Recursive. Uh, can you, Sasha, also introduce yourself and say a couple of more words on your, the work you're doing? 
So hi, good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here. My name is Sasha. I'm the founder of Recursive. We are a venture capital backed uh, company based out of Berlin. And um, we're working on accelerating tr the transition to the ownership economy. And what we mean by that is we think companies should be primarily owned by um, all stakeholders, not just employees, but also partners, suppliers, customers. And we are building solutions that enable that. So um, the first product is a solution to tokenize uh, equity. Thank Very you so happy. much. Thank you so much, Sasha. It's great to to see how much resonance there is with the, with the work that we are doing and the Hyatt is doing. So looking forward to change some ideas with you. So in terms of today's session, we are on a packed agenda today. So uh, the pace is gonna be very, very fast. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction on what is happening with contracts and organizations and how things are evolving. Then Emanuele will give you a quick demo on the EMCOS project. Uh, and showing you some use cases that we are developing. And then we're gonna have a discussion with our two panelists. There is also going to be, um, sorry, I forgot actually a video from Brian Peters that uh, we're gonna show. Brian has recorded the video uh, with us uh, um, before the event. Uh, and Brian is founder, co-founder of Sobol. Uh, that is a software solution that is essentially working in this same space and also collaborator of, uh, of the consensus as well. And, and also an expert and uh, contributor to several DAOs. And uh, uh, why these three people here on the on the on the chat? Because these three people helped us to shape this AMCOS conversation from the very start. So again, thank you so much, guys, for the for the great contribution. Um, then we're gonna have a discussion with our panelists, and if there is time, hopefully yes, we're gonna capture some questions from the audience. So please uh, use the Q and A feature if possible. Otherwise, share your questions in the chat, and I will try to pick some for the end. So uh, let me just uh, in, uh, introduce the conversation. Let's say so. Uh, what what is what is happening in the uh, in the in, in the organizational space? What is this emerging model we are seeing? Essentially, we are seeing this emerging model based on small units uh, that dynamically cooperate through contracting or dynamically, uh, you know, relating with each other with shared services that support uh, these systems to evolve. And why is this organizational model emerging? Essentially because a low transaction cost makes it possible because it's enable companies to behave, to perform better on the market. So essentially allows companies to manage and to produce both, uh, let's say scale uh, standardization when needed, but also diversification and differentiation that are essential to the world of today where everything is niche and everything is specific. So uh, this is why this is a winning uh, model. And uh, uh, again, uh, the recurring artifacts in these organizations that we see are essentially um, uh, these small units that used uh, these shared services and uh, uh, in, engage in this contracting between parties. Most specifically, this contracting element, it's not... Uh, 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 you know, developed at the same level everywhere. Of course, uh, higher is much more advanced with the EMCs, but all other forms of inter-unit contracting into companies uh, with different PNL, uh, it's it's emerging also across other other companies. And indeed, essentially, we are we are moving along this. Uh, um, evolution between hierarchies and uh, small units with dynamic contracting. And this is having, uh, uh, of course, impacts in many aspects of an organization, starting from how the purpose is evolving, how direction and strategy are evolving, how work is perceived, and also how leverage in terms of uh, uh, shaping and, and moving organization forward needs to be enacted. So there are major challenges in how we manage our organization as we move through this uh, uh, transition and of course uh, it's a spectrum so i put some logos here to you know to, to explain how different companies are moving along the spectrum with different choices but you can see definitely parallels also in how companies like amazon or or higher works and or ing or zappos so there is a really a set of uh, let's say elements that uh, make uh, the special approach of each organization but you can recognize these three pillars, these pillars based on uh, units, uh, support, shared support services, and interaction between, between units uh, through contracts or direct relationships. And of course, there are also extremes that we are seeing coming up from the market in terms of uh, 
uh, of the role of contracts. And of course, uh, the most, uh, probably the most uh, interesting experiences we are seeing coming up are related to uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, this new type of organizations that uh, are pushing uh, you know, the forward a lot this idea of uh, contracts, of agreements between e units, between parties. And this is an example, the Lao, that is essentially a kind of a venture uh, building uh, in investing firm that is based on very simple uh, uh, you know decision making process that is enacted through a I would say a autonomous uh, system and uh, and uh, um, you know when we look into higher what do we see essentially is the most advanced application of uh, organizational contracting in a corporate setting and uh, it's very interesting because essentially it's very outcome focused, it's very, uh, it's pushing all the contributors, all the units that participated to these contracts to explicitate their commitment into creating resources, allocating capabilities into creating new scenarios for the market and includes uh, more the rituals and, 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 and processes for adaptation and uh, also includes a reputation mechanism that is very interesting in uh, uh, you know, helping the organization move forward with quality. Uh, the mechanisms that characterize uh, hires contracts are, are uh, um, essentially uh, fractal. Why we see this fractal nature of the organization? So, for example, to participate in a unit in hire, uh, you have to bid, you have to contract essentially the, uh, the contribution you can give and the uh, I would say the returns that you get back in terms of ownership, in terms of profits, and in terms of other elements. And uh, uh, this happens at each node. So we are embracing this idea that organizations are also evolving towards some kind of fractalness where you have several layers of nodes that uh, coalesce around objectives through agreements. So that's the kind of vision of organization that is emerging from higher, but also from the market. And this uh, skin in the game that is pushed across the organization very widely has different, uh, I would say, nuances, different elements. And of course, there is the element of salary, adaptive salary. There is the element of sharing profits. There is an element of accessing equity and ownership of the new node that is being created. But also there is a, a matter of uh, having skin in the game in terms of governance. So, for example, managing this governance, uh, these organizational commons that are uh, created. And this is uh, more also more uh, advanced, for example, in the context of decentralized autonomous organizations at the moment. So we are seeing these contracts emerging, these new ways of uh, contracting. For example, this is an, an example that uh, from a project we are running with a major financial uh, players, player in Europe, as we help uh, this company transition towards uh, adopting a trio uh, management style. And uh, we see that every company has its own way to configure and adapt to, this, to these systems. So uh, essentially contracts become extremely important. We, uh, we see that there is an importance to cover the full life cycle of a contract to invest into uh, contract user experience. And this is why we are working on this software piece and also why these folks here on the, on the panel today are all working on this topic. And the impacts, and I'm almost done for the intro, but the impacts on, on management and leadership are huge. So essentially we, we see a leadership uh, that now needs to confront with topics such as designing and architecting constraints into this scalable system. Uh, we need to develop a management that uh, doesn't just blindly apply these, uh, um, uh, you know, unbundling policies uh, uh, for the organization, but needs to do it in a market-driven way. And, and of course, you know, looking at the system, the portfolio becomes much more, much more important. Uh, so, uh, uh, essentially, these new tools are needed because we have to reduce friction. We have to help these uh, processes to flow much better. There are challenges uh, in terms of user experience, challenges in terms of the affordance that technologies bring to the organization. So essentially, what I mean here is embracing these processes without the support of a technology that lends itself to be used in this way is going to be extremely more challenging. So we need these softwares to really uh, be a, a central essential part of 
transitioning towards these new models of organizing. So uh, here enters uh, EMCOS. Uh, EMCOS uh, is uh, uh, the project that we're gonna talk about uh, late, uh, now in, in, a, in a demo that we are embarking with the uh, Model Institute. And essentially the vision of EMCOS is to enable this ecosystemic contracting, these new ways of organizing, uh, um, basically specifying a, a shared model that many organizations are using and many organizations can use to let uh, skin in the game become ubiquitous in organizations. And uh, also essentially to uh, uh, allow organiz organizations to collaborate according to the same language, let's say, or the same tools across their borders. So we don't want organizations to just be con constrained in their boundaries, but really think uh, in terms of boundaryless uh, interactions between, uh, between them. And, uh, what are we what are we doing uh, uh, essentially at the moment at the moment we have uh, we are specifying this uh, domain model we want to have a domain model that is uh, uh, always uh, uh, sorry always uh, um, agreed and always shared across uh, all the players that will decide to join this work and we have this idea of an alliance of which I will talk about more later on and uh, again we are designing this domain model, this system, according to this idea of a fractalness of organizing. So uh, the idea of nodes that are made of uh, uh, um, essentially uh, agreements around, uh, around other nodes that agree on an objective and commit resources and uh, produce a certain, a certain collaboration. But Emanuele will tell you more in a, in a moment. Uh, this is, of course, not new. So, I mean, uh, uh, it's a piece of work that uh, where players are working since a while now, and these are some of the brands that I will that have been working on the on enabling this kind of uh, uh, orga organizational model. Of course, the most famous probably here is Glassfrog, part of the Holacracy um, ecosystem. And, uh, uh, and uh, the architecture I, I were thinking about, and really I, I'm done, then I will lend it to Manuela for the demo. The architecture we are thinking about at the moment is an architecture based on a separation of layer uh, where you, uh, we will uh, aim at specifying very well all the interfaces so that what we can achieve is a, is an architecture that is uh, based on a data and infrastructural model that is really shared and produced by the, the collaboration of many parties. So imagine a shared infrastructure that runs in a transparent way and in a fully, you know, with, a, with high integrity and uh, trusted by all the parties that decide to collaborate. And when I say all the parties, again, I'm referring to many organizations that can interact on each other. At the same time, leaving uh, the, the, the designers and third parties to develop, uh, 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 let's say, additions, extensions to these, uh, to these systems so that uh, companies such as, for example, Recursive or Cone or others can develop uh, vertical integrations to how they see organizations in, interacting, all based on uh, this shared model of small units support services and inter unit contracting. So for example, uh, one extension can look into ownership like uh, Sasha said, or another extension can look into visualizations or another extension can look into, I don't know, agreements or, ra or, or uh, practices or, or, uh, or other elements that can be complementary to the, basics, uh, the basic features. Um, so this is, of course, uh, uh, lots of inspirations. We are thinking about uh, the modern, these modern platforms that create uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, you know, very uh, uh, interacting and large ecosystems of third parties that develop applications such as uh, App Exchange from Salesforce or Shopify, but also inspired by initiatives such as Open Compute that has been transforming uh, uh, computing and and. Uh, um, uh, data center and computing center des design and creation thanks to open standards and uh, al alliance-based uh, governance and collaborations. So this is uh, all for my introduction. I will ask Emanuele to just comment on the use cases that uh, he will uh, show you in a minute, and then I will leave it to you, Emanuele, for a quick uh, demo and then the debate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good morning and good afternoon to all our friends. Uh, 
listening to us. So let me just uh, stress uh, one point before getting into the, the, the demo. Why are we doing this? We are doing this for three reasons. Uh, the first one is that we want to make uh, value exchange among the different parts of the organization and different organizations visible. This is happening. We are exchanging value among units, but we cannot see it. We cannot act on it. The, the second point uh, is that uh, we believe that the same concepts that Hire is exploring uh, can be universally applied uh, with different extents and different ways uh, in the rest of the world. So we want something that is flexible. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, the third point is that we want to make all of this scalable. So we want to enable organizations not to have three migrant enterprises, but 3,000 migrant enterprises that can recombine themselves and collaborate uh, in a very smooth way. So what we are doing with the EMC OS is to think about uh, a number of user needs. So it's a user-centric process of design from which uh, a number of functionalities are emerging. And we already have a long list. The first list uh, is, uh, yeah, how you can create an organization in a fractal way. So how you can take templates and build your unique organization by mixing the ingredients with two clicks. And this is something I'm going to show you. It's about how can we create micro enterprises? How can we create uh, ecosystem micro communities? How can we bid? this concept that Simone was describing. So ask for services and bid on services, how you can automatically share value among the different parties. So this is something that is, is emerging. We believe this is the core to enable thousands or tens of thousands of organizations around the world to, you know, to have their own implementation of the ideas that, uh, that Hire has been pioneering the last 40, 40 years. So let me share um, my screen. I hope you can see it. It will be a very brief, uh, brief uh, demo. The first step I would like to show you is how you can personalize, how you can design your organization. As Simone was saying, we're thinking about a fractal model. And I hope uh, uh, you, can see, you can see my screen moving. Oh, yes. um, so basically we have abstracted a number of properties that all the nodes at the different levels of complexity of the organization may have. One of them is, is there an owner for this node? This, does this node have equity? Uh, as it profit sharing, uh, as it leading targets? So we have uh, extracted a number of characteristics uh, and basically we can uh, define an organization that has as many levels as we want. You may have one level of EMCs or three levels of EMCs without changing anything, it's just one click. And you can also change the names uh, of, of the nodes. So for example, this is an implementation that could look like higher with members, with migrant enterprises, with EMCs and with platform. But you can define as many as you want uh, and uh, and the software will, will basically reconfigure based on that. This is the first important concept to make it accessible to, to everybody. A second very important concept is the EMC creation journey. And we are going to have a wizard that will help us to create EMCs around the user scenarios to describe the services that they cover, but also to explain the conditions to which a migrant enterprise are going to join the, the EMCs. So the EMC will have owners. Uh, it will be launched based on a market scenario analysis that the owner or the owners are going to, to submit. Uh, it will need to also create a number of uh, detailed insights about consumer behaviors, uh, market capacity, the scale, and group integration capabilities. So this is information that the owner will, will create. And uh, the EMC, uh, of course, will, will have a service catalog. So a number of services uh, with a name, a description that can be, can be created. And it will permit uh, order bidding. This is an example of a bid request I can create a new bid request, let's say for a digital marketing management. I can explain contract duration, a description, performance level, profit sharing. With this order, basically uh, what we are doing is uh, defining uh, 
uh, what we expect to have from migrant enterprises that are joining. And we can define also the leading goals uh, for the EMC, both uh, at the EMC level and uh, at the ecosystem level for all the parties of, of uh, the, the system. We're going to have uh, uh, this huge, huge structure and this huge structure will then enable others to, to join. But we also uh, are empowering, of course, uh, individuals, individual employees to join, uh, to join the system. So let's say that Jane is a new employee that is looking for, for work into, into this space. And given the richness uh, of, of this ecosystem, we have imagined uh, uh, a way to browse it, to surf it, to visualize it, to visualize the uh, industry platforms that you see here in green is just flat fantastic, but you also have experienced EMCs, you also have solution EMCs, user node MEs, and you can basically explore the system. You can click on, uh, on a platform and you can see all the EMCs, let's say EMCU uh, within this platform. And you can see also other MEs, uh, mastery, ASOM ME. Let's say that Jane wants to look at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, Ozom ME, she would see that Ozom ME, maybe it's part of two, uh, two EMCs, uh, that there are a number of uh, colleagues already joining. Uh, she could see the VAM, the valuation adjustment mechanism, and she can also see the open bids. So the opportunities for joining the, the EMC. With multiple visualizations, she can uh, browse. She can browse these opportunities to join based on the pay, based on the location, based on the areas of expertise, filtering on them, and then finding the opportunity that is a good fit to her, and then she can apply for it. And this, after a number of workflows for approval from, from the ME owner, will bring us uh, to a new employee, Jane Stark, uh, joining the ME. This is just a nutshell of what we are doing, but just as a recap, what we are going to, to do is to enable DME to exist in the system with all its performance information, DMC is to be visible in the system with the relationships among MEs and uh, multiple ways to browse and to let people uh, interact by orders and by bidding through an automatic uh, value sharing. Let me stop uh, here, there is much more to see and to share, but uh, time we have, of course, is limited. Uh, this is uh, growing, it's growing uh, through the people also in this, uh, in this room, and we are starting to test it with the market. So we are starting to apply it on real organizations to, to improve it and, uh, and also to extend it together. Back to you, Simone. Thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, on time, so there's enough time to have a conversation with our friends here, Sasha and Rob. But before that, I would like to share with you the video from our third virtual panelist, Brian, that couldn't join us uh, uh, today, but uh, we took a minute to, to record the video. So just uh, let me share it with you. Hello, Brian. It's great to have you, even if uh, offline and uh, in, as a recording, because I'm sure you're going to uh, bring us uh, some very great ideas uh, to, for the continuation of our uh, debate at the Open Talk 2021. Uh, so first of all, I would like to ask you um, to ask you a little bit to frame for, for the participants uh, your experience into this world and, uh, and um, uh, you know, why you think this uh, idea and concepts around uh, you know easy technologically powered organizational contracting is important for for the challenges that businesses and organizations are are living and face uh, uh, today. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I come from a, a background of uh, of working uh, with uh, software startups and uh, that are rapidly growing and scaling. And those are also operating in extremely uh, dynamic market environments. And so under all this change and trying to embrace agile and scaled, scaled agile methodologies, we started to understand um, that 
that if you're going to move this quickly and you're going to decentralize decision making within the organization um, and give a lot more uh, autonomy to nodes and to teams, uh, to people and to teams in the organization, you you have to have a, a, a solid visualization of the current state uh, of that uh, operational model and how it is changing and awareness of how it is changing. And the other thing that, that is required in addition to being able to see that, and that's what we started to work on at uh, Sobel.io, which is the project I'm involved in, um, but it, we, we also need to have uh, well-trodden pathways to contracting with one another. Otherwise, we are inefficient um, in this decentralized market of, of, of micro-venturing and, and, and micro-joint venturing um, and contracting um, talent in and out of ventures uh, quite rapidly and dynamically in a role marketplace. And if you're going to do all of that, you have to have these well-trodden pathways. And we we learned this um, while we were incubating inside Consensus, which is an Ethereum uh, blockchain startup incubator. And uh, it's global. Uh, and it had a large number of people operating across a number of different projects and talent rotating in and out. And what we learned is that uh, when we start to see a good solid pattern of how to do this, and we start to reinforce it with technology like the Ethereum blockchain um, by creating patterns patterns of contract on an infrastructure that we can trust, then we have software that is technologically reinforcing um, you know, these dynamic behaviors, but um, giving them a trusted, um, open, yet flexible path um, to do this contracting without um, much loss um, or time wasted in that phase so they can move forward, create the value, uh, form the agreements to share the value, um, and transact with one another seamlessly. And so um, I think this is really important in order to unlock this and uh, and what do you think uh, what do you think is the value of uh, becoming part of the emc os uh, project so you mean i mean you you have been doing this uh, on your own of course as a technology developer and uh, as a strategist uh, with your company so the point is really why it makes sense to join an ecosystemic effort like the one that we are uh, trying to bring forth with with forward with the with the EMCOS project, and what should we also uh, as weaver of this ecosystem uh, as weavers? What do we need to look into? What are the key things that we need to keep in mind to really ensure the success of the EMCOS uh, project? Yeah, so why I'm very drawn to the project is the project is looking to establish itself using the same principles uh, by which this, this technology and this infrastructure is trying to support. So by taking an ecosystem approach to incubating the technology together, um, I believe that this, this is a, a very important attribute to creating a successful um, and solution um, for these ecosystems. And, and uh, you know, there's a couple of reasons why. I mean, one is, uh, you know, there's there's a sort of the Conway's law, Conway's corollary that you know, uh, you know the the folks building the technology will start to mirror sort of the the architecture of the technology and and vice versa. The technology will start to mirror the organizational design and behaviors of the folks building it. And so that's why one I see uh, that's a very important aspect of the approach. The other is that um, there's uh, already signaling in the MCOS uh, um, initiative that it would need to be open. It will need to be modular. It will need to have well defined infrastructure interfaces that is encouraging continued um, uh, adaptation and innovation instead of a closed eco uh, a closed software solution the more open it is the more it's on uh, you know sort of trusted open infrastructure with those seamless interfaces um, the more I, I believe uh, that uh, will be created that can embrace um, what these rapidly evolving ecosystems need as far as tooling and it I don't believe you can build that without taking an ecosystem approach to collaborate collaboration amongst those building that infrastructure so they can um, move together, dynamically contract um, and share value um, and, and not get caught up in siloing and competing with one another. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. We really look forward to having you part of the specification process and the governance and uh, really appreciate your, your contribution to the session. So thank you so much. And I'm sure you will enjoy the, the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's just great to be able to be included in this way. Okay, that, that okay. That was Brian, and I'm also back with video. So uh, I would like to use to some extent Brian's points that he raised uh, during the during the quick intro, his experience, but also his. I think it's very interesting uh, 
reflection on doing this in this ecosystemic uh, way uh, to open also the space for our two other panelists. So I will start with, um, with uh, Rob that also has this connection with Brian as you work it together a lot. Uh, and so Rob, my, my initial question for you would be why this project is relevant, why it makes sense to have a, uh, an, you know, a kind of uh, ecosystemic approach that tries to get uh, everybody in and to create what I call a, a, a much broader case for collaboration versus a case for competition. So how we do that? Yeah, so, so um, you know, in my experience working in decentralized organizations, or again, I, I worked with uh, Zappos as they implemented Holacracy. As um, you know, my my take on the sh I, what I would consider the shortcomings of Holacracy is that it attempts to be a decentralized org structure, but it doesn't have good systematic decentralized resource allocation and decentralized accountability. And we uh, uh, independently, actually, uh, I, I I came to the conclusion after leaving Zappos that a market based rent and high style approach. Uh, would solve that, uh, and, and as did Zappos, and they started pursuing their market-based dynamic strategy and building building tools for that. Um, so, so the we we kind of both uh, came to came to view that really what's happening um, when you take a market-based approach is you're taking away the monopoly on on resource allocation from the executive team or from the hierarchy and having uh, teams beholden to their uh, their stakeholders in the organization, which is good from a um, alignment standpoint, but also good from a, you know, there's just limitations on the ability of a hierarchy to scale information flow. So uh, that's why we feel, I feel this is so relevant. And the software aspect is just a matter of, of making the implementation of this more feasible to lighten the burden on, on folks that are participating in these systems. Thank you. And, and Sasha, I want to uh, also ask your, your point of view, because you, I think you bring something very important also with recursive, that is, uh, I would say, the connection between what normally happens inside with what happens outside of the traditional border of the organization. So, for example, in the intro, you stress the point that you don't want, don't want to just enable ownership uh, to be shared across the employees, but also with the partners that uh, essentially contribute to the business model. And this is a very important point. And in my experience, it's also very central to hires culture. And when I work with my colleagues from, from China, they always think about, you know, how do we run this business model in a way that everybody's motivated to contribute our users, our third parties in the ecosystem. So I think you can uh, bring to the project that is really need to, to, to look beyond the organization to find ways to motivate and to share agreements also with the people that help us to run these business models, these innovative business models. Yes, and um, I think so the way why we're excited about this project is um, because we we look at it from a from a customer perspective or end user perspective and for us that means that um, what Haya has been doing and how that has um, sort of influenced the uh, design of the ideas behind the EMC OS is, um, in, in our mind at least, highly validated, right? It's been uh, proven, tested, and, uh, and um, is probably, <clears throat> for that reason, um, a, a, makes the project pretty promising. And um, we see some parallels there in terms of the... Um, the way companies are changing away from being like siloed large organizations to becoming um, network organizations is something that obviously is part of the um, of the whole idea behind micro enterprises. And um, what we're working on at Recursive is similar in that way because we're trying to help companies to break into smaller units um, of not just teams but also smaller um, ownership notes and um that's probably one of the key reasons why we just started um exchanging ideas around the emcos early on and the, uh, again i if i can ask you both uh, before moving into other topics i would like to ask you just a reflection on you know how does what does it take to run this ecosystemic strategy in a way that makes for you uh, i would say as a representative of you know, in the case of Sasha startup, in the case of Rob, uh, you know, not just one startup, but also his 
other partners that he's working on also. Uh, what does it mean to create this strategy in a way that uh, really, it really is significant? So it's not just another drop in the ocean, but it's something that is really creating this uh, powerful case to say, you know, let's agree because there is a promise of if we share the domain, if you share the language, there is a promise for us to collaborate across boundaries and really have an impact on how we organize and enabling new new elements. So how do we take this project in the right way uh, without making uh, you know uh, mistakes that can, to some extent, uh, water its uh, potential and uh, we really get everybody on board? And of course, not just you, but if you can think of all the players that uh, uh, you know, from the industry that are building so solutions in this space or embracing this organizational model. What do you think? Any of you wants to jump in first? Sure. Rob. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, a couple of different things on the uh, on the software side and the success there. I think what Brian highlighted for it being modular and being open source is key uh, for the uh, the modularity, especially to provide flexibility that organizations might need to suit their needs. Another thing that I think is particularly good about the model you've laid out is the acknowledgement of several different layers. I've seen other projects, um, maybe they're more engineered towards team-based decision-making, but they try to apply a team lens to the entire organization. And, and so the, the acknowledgement and, and building of tools around you know, EMCs versus uh, just the individual team level or or organization wide level and, and having different features for that uh, makes a lot of sense. And then as it relates to just pure implementation of these ideas, um, the organization just needs to needs to buy in. People, you know, if if people have the ability to continue to be fully funded in a traditional annual budget, uh, that is uh, you know, the typical kind of corporate budgeting process. If they if they uh, won't be held accountable for the PNL of their team, they won't be rewarded for the PNL for their team. Then uh, buy-in is very difficult. Um, but if you can if you can buy-in as a, as an organization and have software to lower the difficulty for for people to participate in that system and kind of invest in the onboarding, I've seen I've seen project or companies where they really they hold internal conferences like this one. Um, they they host workshops. They do they do training with team leads to get them prepared to operate in these types of systems and help them draft their menu of services and things like that. Those things can go a long way in helping to make sure that the implementation is successful. So, so you, you point the point that you're raising is probably we don't have to just look into the partners that can build the functionalities, but also the adopters. No, that they are probably the major. Uh, uh, the major place where this uh, strategy, this ecosystem can really make sense. And, and so we have to look into onboarding this organization. So that's a very interesting point. And getting them, I guess, also inside the, the specification of the domain and the, uh, uh, you know, understanding better uh, how these trends are really uh, in being embodied by organizations that are uh, looking into this transformation. Sasha, what your, what's your take in terms of, especially I'm interested in your point of view, because of course you are, representing a startup and all that, which is basically, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, in, in this uh, kind of alpha stage launching these days with some first uh, customers. So what's your feeling in terms of how can I participate to this without, uh, um, you, know, you know, kind of losing my brand and my startup uh, capability to reach the market, you know, as part of a broader system. So I'm really interested in understanding how do you see that? Do you see that as a channel to bring your value proposition to a broader market as a way to uh, learn something new and be more, uh, I would say, uh, in line with the trends that are emerging? How do you see that? So um, I think it's definitely um, something where we can learn um, from the, the overall project. But what I find um, most exciting is the um, the opportunity for us to bring that um, ownership, sharing ownership into another project and um, to enable yeah, other organizations to, um, to do so as well, to share ownership with, um, yes, with employees or, or customers or partners. And um, the more of that uh, there is in the market generally, the better for us as well. So uh, there aren't that many projects that have that are about sharing ownership that have an actual sort of um, 
customer focus where you um, where you actually make it easy to um, share ownership with a um, end user. So I think what we like about this is that um, if the software uh, gets brought to market, we can actually share um, uh, ownership with more and more companies and sort of bring, uh, yeah, accelerate that transition to universal base, uh, basic asset ownership generally, right? So we're trying to support anything that, um, that helps uh, anyone, whether it's a small micro enterprise or uh, a creator or a larger company to share ownership with any stakeholder group. And that's probably the main reason why we uh, want to support this. Right. That's, that's an important po topic, you know, and, uh, and I feel it's uh, not so discussed yet. You know? So we, we find a lot of places and, and spaces where there is this discussion on getting employees on board, but uh, probably there is not enough understanding yet, uh, as, as, at least in the, co in the corporate world, let's say, that you really need to look into engaging beyond the, the borders of the organization. This is something maybe that is much more mature in this emerging crypto, crypto space. I, I would like to say two things. First of all, uh, please share questions uh, um, um, in the chat. I see William shared a couple that I'm going to just touch base in a minute. And then I will leave to Emanuele to add uh, some comments because I know that you wanted to, to discuss a little bit about the adoption question and the affordance of technology with what uh, also Rob was pointing out. Yeah, exactly. A couple of points I think uh, that it's important to stress. The first one is that uh, in the market, we already have many examples of softwares playing mostly at the team level or even only at the organizational level. What we are trying to do is dramatically different, is uh, uh, implementing a unified uh, market firm theory. So at the end, uh, taking inspiration from the market, uh, bringing ideas into the organization and guaranteeing this contamination between teams, between units, aggregations of units and the market. So at the end, it's a really a porous model and a fractal and a flexible model of the organization. This is, to me, this is totally new. Um, the second point that I wanted to raise is that uh, we are, as Bandrais, doing uh, lots of uh, consulting, lots of work with real organizations. And many of the ideas that we have uh, demonstrated uh, briefly are coming from them. So we are learning from the market. We are learning from uh, the, the real users of this software. We are getting ideas. We are validating uh, the ideas. So we are iterating with them. And uh, we have already seen lots of interest. So we are already at the point in which many firms uh, have launched micro enterprises or small teams uh, are looking for ways to empower them to establish agreements, contracts, uh, to track value, to share value. So this is urgent. It's urgent now and it's growing real quick. So we are seeing thousands of organizations going in this direction. And that's why we decided to also collaborate with, with IRE, of course, in, uh, in this. So, this is quite unique. It's different from what we have, uh, and it's uh, growing quick, if not uh, exploding. So this is uh, the right time to, to join this alliance and to give your input uh, also because you will benefit uh, as, a, as an organization adopting the software. Thank you. Thank you for your note, Emanuele. Uh, one, one a couple of questions coming. Let's use a few minutes, like five minutes, to answer some questions coming from the audience. So first, first of all, uh, um, uh, William has asked if we have uh, benchmarked uh, the existing smart contracting capabilities in higher. And yes, I, I want to say that, that the, uh, the, the practices that higher is using internally that are most uh, arguably the most advanced at the moment, we, we use them as an inspiration for, for the work they have been doing. But we also understand and recognize uh, the need to work on a user experience that is uh, uh, more targeted maybe to uh, different ways of interacting with software that we recognize are very much culturally also <clears throat> diverse between what happens in China, for example, or in, the, or in Europe or in the US, of course. So there is work to do, even if we are getting a lot of inspiration from uh, the software that I use internally. And also, uh, I would like to use a question from William to share it with our 
with our panelists, uh, share, uh, William asked, uh, what does it need to change in terms of auditing when you, when you look into uh, a company that is made of EMC contracts? But I would extend maybe the question for you uh, in terms of, uh, you know, as we embrace these new ways of creating company agreements, uh, what does it change in terms of not only auditing, but also style of, uh, uh, you know, um, steward an organization, steward, stewarding an organization in a certain direction or taking care of, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, employees and all the, uh, the elements that normally management looks after in a top-down manner in an existing organization. And maybe, Rob, you also, since you also come from this very um, bubbling uh, space no, of DAOs and uh, crypto and you have your, this experience with consensus mesh. How was the style in managing and auditing these organizations different uh, and what needs to change if we go in this direction? Yeah, I think especially with, with the software um, aspect and then also in the case of DAOs, the open transparent nature of blockchain aspect, auditing them uh, is, isn't, as, isn't as difficult um, one one challenge you have is is when teams are interacting directly with each other and not going through um, the central finance function um, and, and making agreements directly one to one. You just need to make sure that you're capturing the metadata around those interactions so that um, there is this, you know it's, you're not just getting uh, raw transactions or or you know um, uh, non transparent interactions that you can't you can't follow up on. But assume that you use are using a software or in the case of DAOs committing to on-chain transactions, it's quite easy to audit. What's, what tends to be more, more difficult, especially for public companies who have a need to forecast, is the forecasting aspect uh, of, of organizations like this. Zappos has built tools into their process, um, in, into their software, uh, specifically for forecasting. Um, but that, that's an area where, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a way, you know, companies are very used to forecasting. You think about cities or you know economic networks that more so resemble the Rendon High model. Um, you don't tend to see cities, you know, budget and forecast the same way. You know, for not just for the city government, but for the all the different you know actors in that ecosystem, the same way because of its decentralized nature. And so that can that can be a, a challenge for some of these types of networks. Thank you, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, Sasha, before we move into the last uh, bits, uh, I, I would like to ask you also a little bit of uh, your experience into embedding these new uh, these new ways of uh, designing uh, engagement policies and and contracts with uh, users, employees, and so on. How how much did you find it difficult to rely on the blockchain uh, for smart contracting? Did, are you looking into that? How is it, how is it going in terms of uh, really uh, making these contracts uh, smart uh, beyond the, the tradition no? that was essentially a bottleneck in terms of user experience into really widespread uh, skin in the game and widespread contracting. Yeah, so um, for me, there's always uh, two, two worlds that, that I'm working in simultaneously. One is uh, on the technology side. So the crypto, um, let's call it the crypto space where there's a lot of excitement about the technologies that are being used in the future of um, organizing. And um, then on the other side, you have this, the, the second world, which uh, you can, I guess, call like the reality of our customers. And um, that there's a big gap in terms of, um, you know, what uh, the technology is promising and where customers currently are. So the things that we are probably um, uh, sort of find most challenging is um, leveraging the underlying um, uh, crypto technology, um, but also making it accessible to the broader public. So if you're sharing ownership with um, a, as a food delivery platform with a bike rider, um, they're not going to have a MetaMask account and they're not going to know what a smart contract is. Um, and that makes uh, things a lot more challenging in terms of designing the user experience and yeah, also um, thinking about what the what actual underlying ownership asset you're really sharing. So um, I think that's sort of the uh, the biggest challenge for us is uh, walking the line between those two worlds. Right. This I think is emerging as a topic. You know, as we see these uh, um, as we see this excitement around, you know, let's really build smart organizations where 
uh, cost of transaction is, 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 br is brought down. And, you know, we do, we create a democratic organizations where everybody can really participate. And there is this massive UX user experience gap that we see, for example, in the crypto space that is emerging. Um, and I think uh, this is really where we are looking for in terms of what value we can also add with the EMCOS project. So to look into, uh, and to quote my friend, Jacopo Romei, that is one of the friend, one of the best uh, ex experts in the world around contracts, uh, when he said, you know, he told me, we need to look into the UX of contracts. We need to look into the user experience of this new way of organizing. We need to be, be to build these affordances, the new affordances uh, to use technology as a way to, to really reach everybody, you know, in a way that is, uh, inclusive and not in a way that as often we have seen uh, uh, technology becomes a way to make the difference between those who get it and those who don't so i think that's a very important a very important point so there are a couple of more questions in the chat that i would like to uh, to just try to address quickly before we close uh, VA, there's a question on how the, the vam contracting works in this software Again, at the moment, we are scoping this software. So the VAM value adjustment mechanisms are part of the creation of the node. So when Emanuele explained, how do you create the node? This is where you sign the contract you now with the other organizational counterparts. And there are ways in the software to, to configure if the creation of the nodes needs some kind of double check from the inside of the organization, for example, for capital allocation or resource allocation. And uh, uh, then there, is, there are other questions on the chat that unfortunately we, don't, we not, do not have time to answer now because we have only three minutes. So before, uh, first of all, let me share with you the final bits. Um, uh, so the screen, let me say, share my screen. Uh, you see my snow, all right, just a second. Uh, yes. So first of all, I would like to close this panel, this amazing panel with just a call to action. We are building this alliance. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be an open collective. You, you will find in this alliance people like the ones that you had here in the panel today, like Sasha, Rob, uh, Brian, myself, uh, HMI, Emanuele, Bandless. We are starting to build this. So it's open. It's an open process. We really look forward to more collaborators, more adopters that want to adopt this software, more organizational development firm, more software development companies that are developing tools in this space that want to possibly become part of the system, so become compatible with this system. We're looking forward to an alliance, to a governance process that is really open and inclusive, like, for example, Open Compute has been doing and is a great inspiration for, for us. Um, coming up in, in our universe, there are two trainings that I want to remind you about. There is a, a, a trio masterclass coming up in October, uh, pretty soon. Uh, so really, um, uh, it's great for you to catch up with. Um, there's also a platform design bootcamp coming up in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you're interested in our open source framework at Boundless, Credit Commons, always accessible, check this out. Um, I think Emmanuel also shared something in the chat. Uh, then uh, download the toolkits, engage with these processes in an open way. These toolkits are free to use, open to commercial users. So don't, don't have any issue. You don't have any issue in using them. And we're looking forward for users' feedback. So participate into this process. And uh, finally, there is our research you can catch up with. We are running a blog, a podcasting uh, series that is coming up in October with this third series. And uh, in the second series, as you can see here, there is an amazing episode we have run with uh, Brian, Rob, and Sasha really around this work that we are doing that goes much more in deep into some of the concepts we had discussed uh, today. And there is our newsletter you can also catch up with. Please get in touch if you want to become part of the Alliance uh, as a contributor, as an investor, we are looking at, at partners that want to invest with us into, into this space to develop these solutions and this challenging but exciting ecosystem strategy. Last minute, I want to thank you guys, Sasha, Rob first, and Brian from, from, from remote. And let me say a special thank for Rob that is already is 4 a.m. in the night, just a couple of hours of sleep after, after uh, business travel. Sasha, good luck with the launch of Recursive. Uh, keep an eye on that. And, uh, um, and Emanuele, thank you for, for your contribution. And a higher thanks for organizing this amazing uh, conference uh, follow-on. And thanks to Thinkers50 for, for co-hosting it. 
excited to look forward for the future. Thank you so much and talk to you soon. Thank you.